The Holocaust was a defining event in human history, whose legacies continue to shape the modern world. For the first and so far only time, a state and its collaborators attempted to murder an entire people using all of the resources at their disposal. The results fundamentally changed the fabric of European society and culture and had global reverberations. A study of the Holocaust can therefore help us to think critically about the world around us and our place in it. Many governments, organisations and individuals across the world have commemorated the Holocaust in a variety of ways. Nonetheless, the question of how societies meaningfully remember, properly honouring the lost individuals, families and communities, whilst also grappling with the troubling questions about human nature raised by mass murder on such an unprecedented scale, is one that becomes more pressing with the passage of time, as the Holocaust begins to slip out of living memory. In particular, Holocaust education and remembrance in many countries have relied on the uniquely powerful resource of survivor testimony. The question of how to preserve this legacy once Holocaust survivors are no longer able to deliver their testimonies in person is a challenging one. One way in which this legacy is being preserved is through literature. Hard though it may be to credit, a considerable body of literature was created by Europe's Jews during the Holocaust in ghettos, in hiding, and even in a small but significant number of cases, in camps. Although every type of literature was produced, two forms predominated, diaries and poetry. Hundreds of diaries written during the Holocaust have survived, with Anne Frank's being only the best known. The act of writing a diary is of course an intensely personal one, and may be carried out for a variety of motives. Indeed, some examples were begun before the war. Nonetheless, as Nazi persecution escalated towards murder, diaries were increasingly written as a direct response to the developing tragedy. In some cases, the motivation was again clearly personal. In other words, a diary offered a chance for its author to grapple with the apparently inexplicable and uncontrollable misfortunes afflicting them. However, a growing number of Jews turned to diaries with posterity in mind. Though the literary quality of the diaries is inevitably variable, they, like other such works produced by Jews across Nazi-occupied Europe, offer us a compelling and uniquely powerful means of exploring the reality of life during the Holocaust. Like diaries, poetry served several purposes. Poems gave writers the opportunity to express their feelings and probe moral questions in a way what they felt prose would not allow. As Frieda Aaron, herself a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto and later a professor of literature put it, poetry was the dominant literary response to the Holocaust because of its greater ability than prose to generate the most exact correlations for feelings and states of consciousness in response to the unfolding catastrophe. Like diaries, poems could act as a form of testimony, recording the reality of life and death in the ghettos and elsewhere. However, much of the poetry written during the Holocaust had a more immediate purpose. Poets were consciously writing for an audience and their poems were widely distributed through underground printing presses or by word of mouth. Thus, they offered ghetto residents a form of moral sustenance and can also be seen as examples of what has been termed spiritual resistance. The creation of something as beautiful as a poem was an assertion of the human spirit which some have seen as a form of resistance in itself. More broadly, poems often served as direct incitements to physical resistance. Some were set to music and adopted as anthems by the growing number of Jewish resistance groups in the larger ghettos and in the forests of Eastern Europe. Yet it was not only Jewish poets who reacted to the Holocaust. Even before the war, W.H. Auden had commented on the indifference of the democracies to the fate of German Jews in his widely anthologised 1939 poem, Refugee Blues, whose rhythms, like several works written by Auden in the late 1930s, were inspired by blues music and include vivid comparisons with the natural world. In any event, the decades since the Second World War have produced many works of literature which have attempted to represent the Holocaust and to force their readers to confront the uncomfortable questions raised by it.
Indeed, it was literature rather than history, which tended to dominate written responses in the first decade or more after the war, when historians, other than those writing in Yiddish, largely ignored or marginalised the subject. Several survivors wrote memoirs of immense power very soon after the war. Notably, Primo Levi's If This Is A Man, originally published in Italian in 1947. Others mourn the victims and their destroyed communities through poetry or prose fiction. Some writers sought to destroy or disfigure literary conventions and to refashion language in an attempt to convey the Holocaust senselessness and incomprehensibility. However, the greatest impact on the reading public came, of course, through the diary of Anne Frank. First published in Dutch in 1947 and in English in 1952, the book became a global phenomenon in the 1950s. As the Holocaust began to enter wider public consciousness from the 1960s onwards, it attracted even greater numbers of authors, including those writing in English a language which had hitherto generated very little Holocaust literature. By the 1980s and early 1990s, prominent literary figures such as D.M. Thomas were tackling the Holocaust in novels which garnered press attention and literary prizes in equal measure. Indeed, novels have rather superseded poetry as the dominant creative literary response to the Holocaust in most languages in recent decades a development which shows no sign of abating, as evidenced by the awards bestowed in the 21st century. This trend has been even more pronounced in the realm of children's fiction. Although some novels for younger readers were written at a relatively early date, such as Judith Kerr's When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit, an extraordinary number have been produced from the 1990s onwards. The quality and historical veracity of such works has been rather variable. But in the hands of gifted children's storytellers, such as Michael Mapergo, the Holocaust has often been handled honestly, yet sensitively. The broader impact of the Holocaust on post-war literature should also be noted. Though seldom in the foreground, it is a near constant subtext in the words of some of the year's greatest writers. And then there are those works which do not openly address the Holocaust at all, but which some critics have seen as written under its shadow. Lord of the Flies, for example, or Beckett's plays. While such attributions have not convinced all observers, there can be little doubt that there are few, if any, historical events which have had such a profound and enduring impact on modern literature as the Holocaust. Despite the immense power and impact of many novels, poems and plays, such as those already discussed, Perhaps the most remarkable literature to have emerged in response to the Holocaust is that of survivor testimony. Indeed, Elie Vessel, whose Night, first published in French in 1958 as a heavily edited version of an earlier Yiddish memoir, is the best known example of the genre. It went so far as to claim that if the Greeks invented tragedy and the Renaissance the sonnet, our generation invented a new literature, that of testimony. This is not to say that earlier generations did not write about horrific events. However, as Professor Robert Eagleston has argued, Holocaust testimony has its own form and its own generic rules, which differentiate it from fiction and from autobiography. In particular, Eaglestone has highlighted the presence of a variety of generic markers, including the frequent use of a style of writing more commonly associated with history, interruptions in their narrative and disruptions in their chronology, and a lack of closure, which preclude the easy identification of the reader with the protagonists and their experiences. As a result, testimony is an encounter with otherness, which forms a genre of its own that holds best the memory of the Holocaust. As already indicated, testimonies were written immediately after the war, or even in some cases during it. The numbers continue to increase, due not least to the wish of growing numbers of survivors to record their experiences whilst there is still time. Of course, this inevitably entails wide variations in quality as texts, though many testimonies, notably Knight and Levy's If This Is A Man, are works of great literary merit. As Eli Weissel indicated, and indeed demonstrated through his own works, Testimony, by offering the reader an unsettling encounter with events and experiences that appear to define normal human comprehension, 
encourages us to reflect on both the Holocaust itself and the nature and limitations of literary representation. Few books in recent years have had such an impact as John Boyne's The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. The reasons for the novel's popularity are not hard to fathom. It offers a readable mediation on friendship and the dangers of prejudice. However, reception of the book has been rather different in the world of Holocaust education, where it has been widely criticised for what historians and survivors consider its distorted representation of the Holocaust. It would, of course, be unreasonable to expect any work of fiction to remain absolutely faithful to historical reality. Indeed, it has often been suggested that it is impossible to accurately render the full horror and complexity of the Holocaust in the written word. Nonetheless, the problems with the boy in the striped pyjamas go beyond those inherent in the genre. After all, many other writers have allied their literary imagination to diligent research to create texts, including many for children, which both grip the reader and take them closer to the essence of the Holocaust. By contrast, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas betrays such a lack of knowledge of the Holocaust, and of Auschwitz, Birkenau in particular, that it is a fable in more than one sense intended by Boyne. The many criticisms made of the book can essentially be distilled into three main charges. Charge number one, historical inaccuracy. John Boyne has given contradictory public statements as to the extent to which he researched the novel. Whatever the truth, the text is riddled with historical errors. Some of these might generously be seen as devices necessary to advance the narrative, such as the curiously unelectrified and unguarded fences at the largest death camp in Europe, or indeed the rather radical recasting of the geography of Auschwitz-Birkenau camp system. Of greater concern is the fact that the entire novel is based on a fallacy. Nine-year-old Jewish children were not allowed to spend months in the camp gradually starving to death. They were murdered as soon as they arrived. The only known exception to this rule was the curious case of the family camp, established deep within Birkenau and thus completely inaccessible to the outside world in late 1943 where Czech Jews were held for six months before being sent to the gas chambers. This unique phenomenon, which was probably related to SS attempts to mislead the International Red Cross in the event of an inspection, is in any case irrelevant to the child in Boyne's book, who readers can infer was deported from Krakow to Auschwitz in 1942 or 1943. Charge two, characterisation. The implausibility which runs throughout the story is personified in the breathtakingly inattentive Bruno, whose extraordinary ignorance of the world around him is reflected in his repeated inability to understand the word Führer, a term and an individual with which most German children half his age would have been completely familiar. Imagine a British boy or girl not knowing the word leader, its exact English equivalent. Indeed, the suggestion that any German nine-year-old, still less the son of a senior SS officer, would have been unaware of Hitler, Jews, or even as it seems to be the case with Bruno, the existence of the Second World War, utterly ignores the, the lengths to which the Nazis went to win the hearts and minds of children. That they taught nine-year-olds to hate Jews might be considered important to an understanding of what made an event such as the Holocaust possible. Charge number three, messages. It may be argued that a story which presents itself as a fable can be excused in its implausibility, since it is a vehicle to convey a more elemental truth. But what truths does the boy in the striped pyjamas offer? Whilst it is clearly intended as a warning against hatred and prejudice, readers, especially those with little or no prior knowledge of the Holocaust, may also derive rather worrying messages from the book. The characterisation of Bruno is symptomatic with a wider trend in the narrative, which implies that most ordinary people were either ignorant of Nazi crimes or, as in the case of Bruno's grandmother, hostile to them. This risks reinforcing a comforting but wholly discredited myth widely articulated in post-war Germany. The responsibility of the Holocaust lay with a small criminal minority. Well, this true, 
then the Holocaust would prompt rather less troubling reflections on human nature. Where then does this leave us? Perhaps the most important consideration is to ensure that the novel is only ever studied as a work of fiction and is never presented as a means of learning about the Holocaust, an injunction which need not be applied to almost any other comparable text, even those which are targeted at children of a similar age. A particularly fruitful approach can be to read The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas alongside other texts both works of fiction and testimonies such as those described in this talk. This has the added benefits of enabling us to read a wider range of texts and begin to engage with challenging questions about the nature and purpose of literature. So as the Holocaust moves further into history, what are the challenges in ensuring that people know about and remember it? Key issues might include how to preserve testimony once survivors are no longer able to deliver it, how to remember individuals and communities which were destroyed, including those whose names and identities are not known, which aspects of the history of the Holocaust to focus on, how to represent the complexity of the Holocaust in a way that avoids simplistic cliches, how to relate it to Europe's history in a meaningful and honest way. Whilst the Holocaust was unique, there are important universal lessons to be acted upon. The genocide of European Jewry succeeded not only because of the state sanctioned culture of hate and industry of death, but because of crimes of indifference and because of conspiracies of silence. We have already witnessed an appalling indifference and inaction in our own day, which took us down the road to the unspeakable, the genocide in Rwanda unspeakable because this genocide was preventable. No one can say that we did not know. We knew, but we did not act, just as we knew and did not act to stop the genocide by attrition in Defoe. Indifference and inaction always mean coming down on the side of the victimizer, never on the side of the victim. We remember and we trust that never again will we be silent or indifferent in the face of evil. Therefore, I'd like to leave you with the thought that Holocaust remembrance must not only be an act of remembrance, but a remembrance to act. <laughs>